Thank you, Wayne. Um, it's very nice to come here and speak with you all. Um, it's been a wonderful experience for me so far, actually, and, and lots of things have kind of churned around in my head, and I've been very excited and stayed up until 2 a.m. most nights, uh, which I shouldn't do. Uh, it's bad for you, don't do it. Um, so, I'll just launch right in. Um, defining any form of temporality, um, indeed even arguing about time, brings with it implicit perspectives and assumptions that at a basic level we know what time itself is and that we share those assumptions with the people with whom we are talking. But of course, even within a singular epoch and culture as well as across the world, there are a polyphony of forms of time. And that being a given, I feel that it is important that I should briefly flesh out my own perspective on the nature of temporality, or ease, in order to be honest with you and to illuminate some of my later arguments. I should say before I begin that if there is one thing I have learned in my study of time, it is that it is like banana peel, slippery and liable to cause arguments. So, oops. Let me move that water out of the way before I throw it all over my laptop. Time and space are fundamental constituents of experience, mediums in which humans live their lives and which make each other evident. Time is presented through changes within space, and space exists within experience due to duration and memory. All locations are what I would term geochronic, that is, saturated with both materiality and temporality. And this is why when I speak of museums, or indeed of any culturalised site, I use Barbara Adams' phrase, timescape. When we look at the etymology of scape, we see that it means to shape. Time allows movement to occur through both duration and change, although I am not speaking here purely of calendar time or historical time. Because of time's extensive character, we can speak of tense. We should not think of tense as a chronological timeline, singular and linear, but like the rocks and wrinkles in this scarf. A topological plane with a multitude of pasts, presents and futures that can be brought together through the folding of memory and expectation. Time and authority are also, oh there you go, yes, this will be important later, time and authority are also indisputably linked. The manipulation of time during the French Revolution, as you can see from this clock, which has 10 days in the week, um, was an attempt to exercise a new form of control, but it caused rage and rebellion. And time is precious to people, for they who control the perception of time control life itself. But how can we then use the notion of carnival in the context of ethnographic museology, a context which is shaped by memory, trauma, control, and objects saturated with multiple meanings? Might it tie into the more multiplicitous histories of museums related to fairgrounds and world's exhibitions, which Barbara, Peter and Wayne have all mentioned? Um, can we use it in a process of re-enchantment and the recovery of rarity? And when and why did we become disenchanted anyway? So. Carne vale, literally meaning farewell to meat, is the word traditionally ascribed to the celebrations, feasting, and disorder of the Catholic pre-Lenten period, depicted here by Bruegel. In this paper, however, I am using it in a much broader sense as a concept emblematic of the liberty of the imagination, an ideology of unbuttoning. The carnivalesque can be found in all situations in which established norms and hierarchies are subverted, and in which there are open equal relations between people, a world of abundance, a world turned inside out. As I stated in my abstract, carnival temporality is the temporality of dust, the excess of material existence in time, the continual transformation from thing to other. The time of carnival as event is unhinged from, but not exclusive of, the everyday. And whilst as event it is positioned at a particular point in the calendar, carnival as concept is able to permeate the everyday entirely. It does so through coevalness and multivalency, the intermingling of temporal layers in spaces and objects, through its acts of transformation and renewal, and through its perpetual incompleteness. The temporality of carnival is the temporality of the flesh, corrupted, grotesque, beautiful, always having been what it is no longer, and always already becoming something else. <coughs> Here, I'm going to explore this temporality with the help of the Russian literary theorist Mikhail Bakhtin, and to his work, I'll add my own thoughts on carnivalesque temporality, for though Bakhtin frequently mentions time, it is not his primary subject. Bakhtin acknowledges the connection between carnival and the calendar, 
the ties which have historically persisted between certain points of the year and celebration or feasting. However, he makes a clear distinction between official feasts and what we might call folk feasting. Official feasts, which were formerly linked to the calendar and repetitive habit, often sanctioned by the church or state, use the past to consecrate the present and in so doing reinforce existing hierarchies. But folk celebrations, Bakhtin argues, are somewhat more emergent and organic, appearing at moments of crisis, that is, changes, for the better or worse, indeed, death, birth and renewal. Their focus is not the past nor repetition, but the present and an ongoing, continuously percolating set of potential futures. Sorry, there's going to be a lot of creepy present, uh, creepy plural today. Um, it is a sequence of time in which free speech is a given, when the lowliest can speak to the highest, openly and without fear of recourse, where Billingsgate and profanity are recognised as justified linguistic forms in their own right. Bartin also identifies in Carnival a separated timescape. Carnival, he says, is the second life of the people. Now, this second life is not simply a play or a pantomime, but a reality all its own, in which everyone participates, real and ideal, all at once. The clown is the figure whom Bartin employs to indicate the slippage that exists between the Carnival timescape and the normal. For a clown or fool is always a clown or a fool, no matter if it is Carnival or not. A central and overtly temporal feature of Bakhtin's concept of the grotesque, which I believe to be closely connected to a carnivalesque sensibility, is degradation. Degradation as a form of change is a clearly temporal phenomenon. It rebels against inertia. As heritage practitioners, we tend to see it as an especially bad thing. Conservation is an explicit part of ICOM's definition of a museum after all, though it was interesting yesterday to hear Renata speak and to question with Wayne how arrogant this notion of in perpetuity is. For Bakhtin, this is not the case. Degradation is not simply a falling apart, but the formation of something new. And his most iconic image of this is found in the Kirsch Terracotta Collection. In the famous Kirsch Terracotta Collection, he writes, we find figurines of senile pregnant hags. Moreover, the old hags are laughing. This is a typical and very strongly expressed grotesque. It is ambivalent. It is a pregnant death, a death that gives birth. And this is almost thermodynamic in ethos, energy shifts, begetting a different kind of thing. And I want at this point to reflect on what Renata talked about yesterday about Damien Hirst's shark and what we might do with a non-marketized attitude towards its demise. Bakhtin's grotesque cannot abide completion and stasis, demanding continual movement and alteration. This is also a condition of the carnivalesque, in which hierarchies are overturned and masks are used to hide identity, in which dancing and feasting unavoidably provoke the appearance of what we might term the material bodily stratum, to which Bakhtin accords such importance in grotesquerie. I would go so far as to call the grotesque a necessary aesthetic and ethical element of the carnival condition. The carnivalesque and grotesque have a gay relativity to them. They are ambivalent sites in which nothing is hurled away and degraded, purely to be annihilated, but in which the discarded is reborn. Again, please remember that poor original shark. Bakhtin frequently makes reference to his belief that the pre-Renaissance forms of carnival were part of a shared universal time. The carnivalesque body, he said, was the people's body, an ancestral inheritance of all. But he also acknowledges that in later periods, the experience of the carnivalesque became more internalized and private. Now, the notion of utterly communal time I find quite problematic because it denies both social and cultural differences and independent modes of perception. Instead, I would like to posit a compromise. The idea of communal time as that scarf I talked about before, a topological landscape made up of an infinitude of different points, each of which corresponds with an individual moment in an individual's time. And make the argument that this is the temporality we experience in any museum, or indeed at any conference such as this. Though speculatively we're sharing a now, my now is not yours. And that shared externalised landscape is very different to what Bakhtin called the interior infinite, that is, the internal workings and depths of a single human consciousness, which can never be fully mined. Bakhtin seems willing to accept that carnivalesque experiences can work on an individual level. He even writes the interior carnival of the Gothic and Romantic periods and emphasises that it would be impossible for the deep, complex and continually shifting mental environment of an individual to exist in an entirely non-carnivalised world. 
Whilst different in character to its communal counterpart, filled more with terror than with laughter, it nonetheless shares those crucial organic, productive, emergent, and ambivalent qualities. These, then, are the basic qualities of temporal carnivality. But what happens when we attempt to extend and step beyond Bakhtin's viewpoint? First of all, I want to connect my earlier comment upon the topological character of time to a somewhat broader discussion of carnival time and space. So, if you'll let me define my terms for a second, pithily, topology is a subset of geometry. And whilst the latter studies questions of shape, size, and position in general, topology studies those features of geometric objects which are not destroyed through the deformation of that object or the environment in which it sits. So, we can imagine that topology is the study of what happens when a donut turns into a coffee mug <laughs> or I crumple this scarf up. <laughs> Topological space, then, is a set of points and neighbourhoods of those points which can be brought into various relationships. One such space is Minkowskian space-time, a combination of the three dimensions of Euclidean space with the fourth dimension of time in which, and this is a key point, the space-time interval between any two events is independent of the inertial frame of reference in which they are recorded. In other words, the connection between singular events in time, no matter how far apart, is completely unrelated to the location or surrounding environment of said event. We can talk about Madeline moments, for example. Essentially, what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way is that carnivalized time is a space of ambivalence in which birth and death combine and which linearity is only a very tiny possible part of the story is evidence that time, and indeed even history, should not be seen simply as a singular line, but a complex, malleable, multi-dimensional fabric of interconnected points. The other spatial issue here is the notion of borders. Bakhtin makes reference to borders in two ways. Firstly, he states that Carnival does not know footlights, that it is all-embracing with an audience which doesn't really exist because they're part of participants in the theatre. And this would imply that it has no borders whilst it is occurring. Secondly, however, Bakhtin talks of clowns as figures who stand on the border line. Outside of Carnival, these clowns remain clowns, acting as ambassadors between these two states of being, which implies that the Carnivalesque does, in fact, have boundaries. To solve this conundrum, we need to think of the relation between Carnival and reality differently. We cannot continue to think of them as entirely independent locations, entirely different heterotopia, as it were, divided from each other. So let's do a quick experiment to illustrate what I mean. If you can raise your first finger and hold it about a foot away from your nose, and I bring it closer. Can you see two fingers? Okay. One we might term to be the spurious real, the other the carnivalesque, and both come together to make your finger as you experience it. So time as it is experienced is, like your finger, a solution of multiple timescapes, including the carnivalesque, all of which influence and intersect with each other. How does this affect our understanding of the contemporary? If the carnivalesque, as we have suggested, is a collection of ongoing revolutionary presents, revolutionary in that they are always already becoming something other than what they were, then the meaning of contemporary becomes sticky and complex. Now, I would like to use an example from Borges to illustrate my point. I'm not going to read this all out um, because it's quite long. But essentially what the quote suggests is that the points in time are momentary and separate. Once brought together through discussion or recall, they are irrevocably changed. So each moment, carnivalesque or otherwise, is unique and unrepeatable, and always slipping out of the contemporary. In turn, this contemporary can only ever be recognized as such when it is already beginning to fade. We cannot, Therefore, regard carnivalesque time as a singular linear form. There are too many presents intersecting, too many possible futures becoming and dying, and too many pasts altered by the act event of counter-remembering. We have been conditioned since the Renaissance to accept linear perspective as the ultimate perceptual reality, temporally and visually. Now, cubists broke this in the visual arts, and now perhaps we as heritage practitioners may have to do the same. If we are to include the diversity and complexity of meaning we desire, we must avoid the historian's disease of chronophobia. Now, I say this as a historian. In invoking the kind of less, we invoke a plurality of times, layer upon layer of continually changing instance, a collective dyschrony. And like the practice of carnival itself, this upsets existing hierarchies and authorities and denies time from those who would use it to gain power. For if all presents, pasts, and futures are instantaneous, ever-changing, and specious, who can grasp them? 
Now we have explicated the idea of carnival in a general sense, I want to look specifically at the Ethnographic Museum. Finally, I did get there. Um, <laughs> in order to do so um, and to explore the potential consequences carnivalist thinking may have, I want to consider a few example situations and objects taken from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England. Uh, because I believe that this institution, along with many other ethnographic museums around the world, offers the perfect harbour for an initial exploration of the carnivalesque in museum work. For it is an ambivalent place with a difficult history, a location which still polarises people and which contain many objects which echo carnivalesque and grotesque ideas. So I'm going to move very, very quickly through this part, um, dividing it into six topical areas, each of which deserve a full paper in their own right. Uh, but which I'm going to skim through like crazy, because, ironically, I'm running out of time. <laughs> so these topical areas are history and tense, collecting practice, display practice, the return of the body, engagement practice, and attitudes towards objects. So history and tense. The Pitt Rivers has a complicated and conflicted relationship with history, histories, particularly its own, but also the history of anthropology as a discipline, the history of museum practice, and the manifold histories of the people and objects represented in its displays. The metaphor of the scarf works very well as an illustration of how it is shaped temporarily, with many pasts, presents, and futures layered and mixed together. But the tensile complexity of this museum is far more extreme. Here we're just going to focus on past, present, and future, but I think that there is the potential for a far deeper exploration of the Pitt River simply in terms of grammatical tense. I'm particularly interested in things like the future perfect. Groom suggests that there is no other type of past than the imaginary. The past is no longer exists as a material thing, no matter if that past is 100 years ago, last Tuesday, or this morning's breakfast. This relates to carnival, which is firmly rooted in multiple revolutionary presents, ongoing renewal and becoming, and therefore shrugging off as what has been. And this does leave us with some potential issues. It is very easy for me, as a fairly privileged white woman, to stand here and speak of the imaginary nature of the past when my own cultural and family history is less than troubled. I do not in any way intend to downplay the horrors of colonialism that have been tied up in the establishment of institutions like the Pitt Rivers. Such things must be recognised if we are to move forward. I'm not sure many museums do this fully, but I'm interested in the ways that they do. I would suggest that all involved in the continuing existence of these institutions adopts a carnivalized approach to the past, treating it as something to be utilized in the present, something which can be continually reinterpreted and turned towards good ends. In so doing, I hope we may be able to slough off outmoded authorities and leave behind the hierarchies of possession which still exist, and yet still further open attitudes to, in order to develop a truly shared ethics of display and collection in which the agency of museum practitioners, audiences and originating communities is acknowledged and blurred. I hope that such an approach would offer both serious and solemn recognition of injustice and a determination to move towards a fairer open future, perhaps one in which there is some sense of experimentation, re-enchantment and wonder. For Carnival, with its open communication and strong sense of Billingsgate, permits those normally limited in terms of their political voice to speak truth to power. The carnivalesque teaches us to speak of and to the pasts on equal terms, not to be hidebound by them, and in their recognition and processing, produce something new. This also means that the present is of prime importance, because only in the present can all the forms of was, is, and will be coalesce. Only by focusing upon the present and through the past, through the recognised lenses of the now and the possible, can the future states we desire be achieved. So we need to recognise the non-singularity of presence and desired futures. Doing so will allow us and our visitors and collaborators to be flexible and clear in setting aims and outcomes, recognising multiple interpretations, complex mental states and varied personal circumstances, the interior infinite of each visitor, the multiplicity of the future and the breaking down of telos. I'm going to skim forward a little bit. Yeah, change is the only constant, I should say. Um, we never know what the future is going to hold, but we do know that it will hold change. So, collecting practice, very, very quickly. Um, on the evidence of what it displays and holds, the past collecting practices of the Pitt Rivers have been dubious, to say the least. But what is the situation now, and what potential impact does a kind of less temporality have? Now, according to its collections development policy, which was adopted in April this year, the Pitt Rivers continues to acquire through photography and collection by graduate students and professional field workers. Increased use, however, is explicitly made of indigenous makers, particularly in the strategic area of photography. The policy also acknowledges the need to acquire within closely monitored legal and ethical frameworks, particularly in the case of human remains. 
And in terms of collecting a recognition of the present as a carnivalized, carnivalized timescape, multifarious, anti-hierarchical, openly communicative, has the potential to redistribute power over objects and their movements amongst not simply anthropologists, but also originating communities and makers. Though written recently and with the best of intentions, I note that in this copy of the policy, indigenous people are only explicitly mentioned as makers and producers, not collectors or academics. Understanding the topological nature of the carnivalesque timescape would allow us to put all people on an equally powerful footing, for by doing so we can acknowledge multiple forms of knowledge possession and an increasingly equitable attribution of value to the different status forms objects hold. Oh good, yes. Display practice, very quickly. And this topological nature of the carnivalized present shows us that each individual museum space is polytemporal and dyschronic. Every now in a museum is an intersection of layered trajectories, always out of joint with, but never disconnected from, other times. It also reminds us that there will always be lacunae, gaps in our tellings, because no matter how complete our facts, we will never have the full psychosocial picture. And this leads to a number of consequences. One, the recognition that no visitor is ever going to see exactly what you intended them to see because they exist in their own unique temporal interior infinite. Removed from the generalised now, you as a curator or designer attempted to create for your idealised viewer however long ago. Um, okay, right. Do you know what? I can send you this. It rambles a bit. No, I'm saying slow down. Slow down? Yeah, a little bit more time. But I oh, okay. It's too quick, but it's done. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm having trouble interpreting hand signals, apparently. <laughs> right, where was I? Da, 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 da. Display practice, da, da, da. psychosocial picture. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, no visitor is ever going to see exactly what you intended them to see because they exist in their own unique temporal interior infinite. Removed from the generalized now, you, as curator or designer, attempt to create for your idealized viewer however long ago. And this isn't a revelation particularly, but it forcibly reminds us that interpretation is as important as intention in the engagement with museum displays, and that all interpretations, however far removed from our aims, have to be given fair hearing. It also reinforces the need for ongoing consultation and engagement when displays are created, updated, and reassessed. Secondly, it reminds us that all museums are multiply authored by professionals from across history, the makers of objects and the visitors who come in through the doors, all these individuals living in a variety of temporal instants. Every visit writes a new version of the museum. On Wednesday, I came in here to look around and I was pleasantly surprised to observe people drawing in the Asia Gallery, something I see far less than I would like. They were reinscribing objects in their own very particular way, conducting a small-scale reappropriation of the space. Thirdly, the carnivalized present reminds us that there are many opportunities for different focalizers, that is, points of view, to be used as the voice of displays. We are not simply restricted to the omniscient museal we. The Pit Rivers is especially interesting in terms of the question of perspective and control in that it retains it, the authorial and therefore some of the authority of prior staff in its historic multiply layered object labels. Whilst in most museums labels are removed if necessary, the Pit Rivers famously and deliberately keeps them on display, turning the cases and objects into palimpsests of object stories and histories of museum practice. This action of the Pit Rivers is particularly carnivalesque because it recognises historic polyvalency among curators and shows to the visitor that the museum is not and never has been an inviolable authority. I strongly believe that museum practitioners need to be more open about their own voices. It is rare that curators are named in museum displays. The redistribution of authority that the carnivalesque offers also requires that individuals now invested with more capacity take responsibility and credit for their work and they can do so by naming themselves. In so doing, we would continue to break down the impersonal, authoritative, institutional voice and offer to the visitor an individual with whom an equitable conversation can be held. Uh, because the carnivalesque demands continual change, movement and production, it is a concept which challenges our existing attitudes towards the display of bodies, whether actual human remains or objects depicting them. It also challenges our approaches to visitor interactions within museum spaces. Now, human remains are a very sensitive topic, and to give this the full respect that it deserves, I intend to produce another paper talking specifically about the carnivalesque and the human body within museum spaces. But here I'll simply offer the headline topics that practitioners adopting a carnivalesque approach might consider. Firstly, conservation. We've talked a little bit about this before, in that uh, sometimes the preservation of human remains is antithetical to the fate for which they were intended. And museums and collectors need to realize and recognize that their desire to conserve does not always, if in truth, 
ever trump this fight. Secondly, re-embodiment and rehumanization. In the Pitt Rivers Museum, we can find many objects that are made from human material, and indeed which clearly present humanity, the Tatsanas and Eritero the mummy. And despite the fact that Eritero, who's up here behind me, has a name, she, as, and is a consequence, recognized as an individual in her own right, she is positioned behind glass and treated like an exemplary scientific specimen. The Tsatsanas suffer the same fate, uh, the shrunken heads, although they also carry with them the aura of the curio. Now, I would like here to posit that it would be valuable to explore how the carnivalesque might be used to rehumanize these objects, and in so doing, accord respect to both their scientific and fleshly corporeal once-living aspects. How might the carnivalesque be used to work against their and other objects' possible reduction to dead matter? I'm going to skim across these last two. I would talk about engagement and objects. This is a Noah mask, by the way, and masks are really important in the carnivalesque, so if you want to ask me about that later, I'm more than willing to talk, but I'm going to skip right ahead uh, and conclude. Oh, yeah, there you go. Masks are important. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so where am I? Bakhtin makes a very clear distinction between classical and carnivalesque art. The former strives for perfection and completion, idealized Roman statues, that taxonomic urge that obliterates history. The latter produces work which is or reflects the incomplete, the continually changing, the grotesque. Many museums, to some degree, tend towards the classical. So, what would a carnivalesque museum look like? Firstly, I think it would be highly corporeal in outlook accepting of the embodied nature of itself, its objects, and its visitors, and as a consequence of the degradation, alteration, and sensory interactions that nature implies and demands. Secondly, it would be a site in which authority was redistributed, where the pasts were tools to be used, not things to be hidebound by, where it and its stories were multifarious, topological timescapes, less heterotopia than superimposed other reels tied to the everyday and other times, where it is accepted that a shared contemporary does not necessarily exist, and that as a consequence, museums can be more accepting of difference and the ongoing changes they will encounter in interpretation and attitudes, where objects are understood as multiplicitous, where the museum allows all to take part in its performance and becomes a true forum, where museum staff can act as harlequins facilitating the transfer between the museum and the everyday, offering the people a voice in response to the hierarchy. Um, I wonder if the clown might be able to cure the curator. Thirdly and lastly, the Carnivalesque Museum would be ambivalent and responsive, able to provoke negative as well as positive responses and all the gamut in between, and be able to respond proactively and from the ground up to all moments of crisis. It would allow visitors as well as staff to reinscribe it privately and publicly whenever they desired, beyond official plans. So quintessence is the absolute evocation, the closest perfection. Dust is the excess of material existence in time. And both carnival and ethnographic museology approach, allegorically at least, the ultimate presencing of dust, that which is now what it is no longer and is always already becoming something else.